Hello everyone, today is a pleasure for me to present the Professor Laura Chavez. She graduated from the Science Faculty at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México with a BSc in Actuarial Science, went on the take a, of MSc studies at the University of Oxford in the Reino Unido and later obtained a PhD degree from Simon from Fraser University in Canada. Laura is a full-time professor at Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Mexico, Science 29, where she regularly teaches and supervises students in the university's undergraduated engineering programs and graduate program on optimizations. Her main academic interest in a combinatorics, particularly graph theory and matrix. Now she talks about the where combinatorics and linear algebra meet. Go ahead, Laura. Hi, everybody. Let me just share this. And we can start. Can you see my screen? We can yes. see it and hear. Yes, and we, we can see. The... Yes. Perfect. So, yes, I want to talk about these mathematical structures um, that live in this intersection of combinatorics and linear algebra. And I think that they are very, very interesting, but I want to introduce them through this real life problem. Imagine that you have some villages that you want to connect. And by that, I mean, you want to build roads between them so that anyone can visit their friends, no matter where they live. So presumably you're doing this on a budget. And so you want to do it in with, you know, spending as little as possible. So imagine that you've decided to build, say, these roads. Now you're considering whether you build a road between these two villages. Well, it would not be very sensible from an economic standpoint because people who live here can already visit their friends. They don't have a direct route, but they can go through some other village and then meet their friends. So if you're really watching your wallet, you would not want to do this kind of thing. So now that you've thought about this problem a little bit, maybe you can look for a suitable mathematical model to work on it. And of course, what would work for you is uh, having a graph, you put a point for each one of your villages. And now, um, every time you can build a road between them, you put an edge between the points and you have what we know as a graph. Now, um, under normal circumstances, some of these roads may not be possible to build. Maybe there's a very tall mountain between them, I don't know. So usually you, what you have is a situation like this. Um, a graph that is not necessarily complete, so there may be villages that you cannot connect directly, and a number associated to each edge, which represents the cost of building the road that, that connects these two cities. And now that you have your model, now you want to solve the problem. And the thing is, um, imagine you don't really know that much about these mathematical things. So the naive approach would be to just go cheap. So you might take the cheapest road and build it, and then the second cheapest, and start exploring your situation from that perspective of just doing locally what is most convenient to you. So if you want to save money, you might start building the cheapest road, then the second cheapest road, and so on, until you hit a situation like this, where the next road you would, you would um, build according to the cost, connects to villages that are already connected somehow. Then at this point, you would decide, this is not something I need to do. Maybe I save these five to build another road. So you throw that one in the bin and you look at the next one. And now, again, we have a problem or, or a, an interesting situation because there are two roads that you could possibly build that have the same cost, right? So now you have to choose. Well, let's just decide on one, build that one. Okay, now we look at the next one, works as well. 
And in fact, with this process, we come up with some solution. The next cheapest roads would be these tents, but of course, they create what we know is called a circuit in the graph or a cycle in the graph. So we would not use these tents. We use the 12. And at this point, we notice that now all of the villages are in fact connected. And we can stop. We have found our solution. Now, this was actually pretty efficient because there are these three other possibilities, these possible roads that I didn't even have to consider. I didn't even need to look at them. I just, I can just stop as soon as I know I've connected everybody. So it, it looks like this might be a very efficient um, method. And the only question is whether it actually works. And as it happens, it does work. This is what is known as the greedy algorithm. And um, it's a very good uh, and efficient and very easy to understand method. The problem is it doesn't always work. So this is another classic operations research problem. Uh, the problem of um, finding a matching in a bipartite graph or um, an assignment that also comes from a real life problem, the problem of matching workers to machines. So imagine that you own a factory and you have workers who are qualified to operate some of your machines and you want to obviously assign them a task and you want to assign them tasks to all of them to have all of your machines working so that you <clears throat> are using your resources effectively. But you also need to make sure that the person assigned the task is qualified to do it. So you would not assign this worker to this machine if he doesn't know how to operate it. So um, let's imagine that we want to use our greedy algorithm for this problem. Maybe let's think that maybe the cost of assigning a worker to a machine is equal for all of the edges. So if I'm proceeding as I just did, I could break this tie in any possible way that I want. So I could maybe assign this worker to this task and now try to grow my solution from this starting point. And I can see right away that there will be a problem because there is this machine, which is evidently a very sophisticated piece of machinery that can only be operated by this person. And I've already assigned this person that other task. <clears throat> So um, maybe there is a solution. In fact, if I look carefully and I start again, I will find that there is a solution in this instance. But if this were the process I was following, I would need to backtrack. I would need to somehow change my mind, erase this assignment and start over. Maybe now being a little bit smarter and assigning this guy to the one machine and now try to grow. Now, if my problem is very big um, and I act in this sort of blind, greedy way, I will continue to run into trouble. There is no, nothing to guarantee that I will be able to build a complete solution out of any partial solution as I did in the previous case. So obviously this algorithm is not going to work for this problem. You know, we do have an algorithm that works for this problem and it's also very nice. It's also um, very pretty as, as far as I, I'm concerned. It's, I, it's one of my favorites, but it's not greedy. It's an algorithm that is throughout the steps of the algorithm is changing back and forth the solution and it doesn't work to do it greedily. So, Okay, that was a lot of combinatorics. Where's the algebra in this whole thing? Maybe what I just did reminded you of some of the things that happen when we do vector spaces. So imagine that I want to work with a vector space spanned by these six vectors. And um, well, I can just think of all the linear combinations of these elements, but um, there's a more compact, convenient representation which is finding a basis. And what we would normally do is to throw these vectors as columns of a matrix and use Gauss elimination or something to find a basis. But in fact, I could do this greedy process as well. 
So Gauss is very good if I just want the basis. But if what I want, I mean, I imagine that now I have a similar situation where each of these elements has a weight assigned to it or a cost. And I want to find the cheapest possible basis. So that would, um, sorry, a little bit of noise. So that, um, imagine that I, that I have a weight assigned to all of these elements. Gauss elimination will give me a base, but it will not give me the cheapest one or the most expensive one. It will just give me some base, I don't know which. But I could do the same process that I just did. Even again, if all of the costs were the same, I could just pick this first element, look at it and say, okay, it's non-zero. So it works, it's a linear independent set. If I put it in a bag, that bag contains a linear independent set. Now I look at the next element, and if I add it to my bag, my bag remains a linear independent set. So I'll put it in, no problem. I look at the next one, and it's clearly a linear combination of the previous two. So if I put it in my bag, I lose this property of linear independence. And so what I would do is just, again, throw it in the bin and keep going. So if I do this process, I can easily build a basis. And again, I never had to backtrack. See, my algorithm, which was very naive, is actually delivering a solution that would be optimal if I had weights assigned. And it does it in a very effective way because again, if I look carefully, um, these columns that I've marked with red are a basis of this vector space, but in fact, they're a basis of all of R4. So once I've added this last vector to my basis, to my independence set, I know that I have a basis and I don't even need to look at this sixth element. I can just stop. I have a basis and I'm done. So there is something about my <clears throat> village problem and something about my vector space problem that make the greedy algorithm work. And what is happening is that precisely these properties of independence and dependence in vector spaces have like a mirror image in graphs. So I've been on purpose trying to avoid graph theory um, language, but I will start talking about um, using terms of from graph theory now. Um, essentially what I'm saying is <clears throat> I could abstract these linear properties, these linear independence properties. And instead of looking at the actual vectors, just look at the labels from these vectors and say, okay, have a finite set with the numbers one through six and the set one, two, four, five, I will call a basis. I will name it a basis and I will make it special. And there is something interesting about this vector, which is about this set, which is that every subset of it is linearly independent. And now I could probably just change my vectors and put different vectors in here. But as long as the linear dependence and linear independence relations between them are preserved, I haven't changed this linearly de independ linear independence structure that this matrix has. So even if I change the vectors, but preserved all the linear independence relations, when I do Gauss elimination, I would end up with you know, these columns being the columns of the basis. So I haven't changed that part. Now, these two things, these vector spaces and graphs are really very close together. So much so that at least in this particular example, I can come up with a graph that has sort of the same structure. So if I look at <clears throat> this problem of the villagers in this graph, and I want to connect all of them, and I choose the elements that I marked here in red, in fact, these elements do connect all of the villages. So I could call this, this collection of edges a basis. And now in my graph theory language, 
I know that this collection of edges is what I would call a spanning tree. So in fact, there's even um, a mirror from the language that this set, one, two, four, five, would be a spanning set of this vector space. And this collection of edges would be a spanning set for the graph. Not that only it has a particular structure when I look at the graph. The fact that I didn't want to include this edge, for instance, because these two elements were already connected, means that there is a cycle or a circuit in, formed by these three edges. So if I look at it closely, this is exactly, exactly the same. I have that I didn't add three because it created a circuit or a linear dependence with one, two. If I add three, it creates a, a circuit with one, two. I did not add six because it makes a circuit with three and five. If you see this minus this gives me this. So sure enough, if I add six, it makes a circuit with three and five. Or if you just want to use elements from the basis, six, one, two, five would make a linear dependence here and it makes a circuit here. So these two topics, sorry, these two topics that seem very dissimilar, linear algebra and combinatorics are in fact very close together. If you know a little bit of graph theory, you know that you can represent a graph by matrices. And we have two matrices that we always use, the adjacency matrix and the incidence matrix. This one is a little bit different. The first time I saw this one was in a book by Trumper. So it is well known, but it's a little bit different from the, um, the other two matrices that we worked. So what I'm trying to say is that these structures are so similar because they have, um, they are both extracting a sort of abstract version of what it means to be linearly independent. This is what Whitney was trying to do. He was studying the abstract properties of linear independent sets. And he came up with this definition. He said, I will call something a matroid if it is a set system, so I will have a ground set and a distinguished family of subsets. This ground set, I'm going to consider it finite, although there are infinite matroids, but let's stick with finite for now. And this distinguished family must have these three properties. The first property is that the empty set must always be in the family. So this is copying what it means to be independent in an independent set. So surely the empty set is an independent set. And in a graph, the empty set is an acyclic graph, would induce an acyclic graph. He's saying if I have a, a, an element in the family, then there must be a sort of monotonous uh, monotonicity to this family so that every subset of my set must also belong to the family. And that does happen with our matrices and with our graphs. If we have a linear independent set, every subset is linearly independent. If I have an acyclic graph, every subgraph is acyclic. So this works too. And now this is a very nice property that is allowing actually the greedy to work. Well, all of them do, but this is a key part of it. Um, that says if I have two sets in my distinguished family and one has less elements than the other one, then there must be an element in the big one that is not in the little one that I can add to the little one and remain in the family. So this is what is saying, if you have an independent set that is not yet a basis, so there are bigger independent sets in your family, there must be some element you can add to grow your independent set. So when I have these conditions, I can start with the empty set and construct a biggest independent set just by adding one element at a time. And I never have to backtrack. And that's what allows me to use the greedy algorithm to solve these two problems that seem very dissimilar in principle, but in fact, well, they have this structure in common. Now this goes <clears throat> Let me now 
explain a little bit better what we mean by the greedy algorithm, because I've been sort of talking about it in a very loose way. <clears throat> so the problem that I'm given is precisely, I'm given a set and a family of subsets with this monotonous monotonicity to it. Once I have an element from the family, every subset also must be in the family. I'm given a weight function for each of the elements in my ground set. And, it's, and this function is additive. If I take a subset of elements, the, the way to find its weight is just add the weights of the elements in the, in the set. And what I'm looking for is an element from the family, so a subset here that belongs to the family that has been playing with minimum, minimum weight, but I could also say maximum weight. No, I could do either of them. So this is the problem. And what's the strategy for this algorithm? We call it an algorithm, but it's not, um, um, not exactly, we'll see why. <coughs> and, sorry, I think it's in the wrong place. But anyway, so this, this connection between matroids and the greedy algorithm, it's a lot closer than it seems because of this theorem that says, um, that the greedy algorithm will solve this problem for every non-negative weight function, even only if this family is in fact a family of independent sets of a matrix. So basically the greedy algorithm gives me an alternative characterization of what it means to be a matrix. So this is really, really close. And now that I've made these connections, I can, what I see that is that I can sort of do a, a dictionary a translation between what is happening in vector spaces and what is happening in graphs. So every time I have an independent set in the vector space, it's as if I had an acyclic, an acyclic graph in, or an, an acyclic subgraph in my graph. If I have a basis, that would be a spanning tree if my graph is connected, or a spanning forest if my graph is not connected. If I have a dependent set in my vector space that corresponds to a subgraph that has circuits, maybe more than one. If this dependent set were minimal, then I would precisely have a circuit. And there's something we haven't really talked about, which is the dimension. And there are many other things, but I'm putting this one in because there's something um, that's been happening with our greedy algorithm, which is that when the algorithm ends, I always end up with a set that has a fixed cardinality. And that fixed cardinality is the size of a basis. That's the biggest independent set. And in vector spaces, we call that the dimension and it's very important for us. So in graph, in graph theory, that would correspond to the rank. And it's also a, a, a constant invariant of the graph that is easy to find. It's just the number of vertices minus one. And it gives me, for instance, a condition to terminate my algorithm. The moment I have a set of this size, I know I can stop. So there are many other, uh, <clears throat> many other ways in which I can um, characterize a matroid. Each one of these, um, each, each one of these uh, elements gives me an axiomatic for matroids. So I can define matroids in terms of their independent sets, in terms of their basis, in terms of their dependent sets, in terms of dimension, in terms of many other things. In, and any one of them would be a good definition of a matroid, also through the greedy algorithm. So this is really what, um, what encodes these structures, and it is common to matrices or vector spaces and to graphs. Now, um, there are more matrices than just the ones that I can get from the columns of a matrix or the ones I can get from graphs. But I want to just mention one extra class. So when I do this abstraction, when I forget about the numbers inside the matrix, and I just look at the 
linear relations between the elements, I am sort of dropping a lot of information. Right? I don't even really care what the numbers are in here. I right? just mm -hmm. care which sets are linearly dependent and which ones are linearly independent. Mm -hmm. But there is a way I can keep a little bit more of the information. And it's as follows. I know, for instance, that these three elements form a linearly dependent set. So if I label my elements E1, E2, up to E6, I know that E1 through E3 form a circuit or a linearly dependent set. And that's because there's a linear combination of these three guys that gives me zero. So I could do a little bit more, I could make an effort, not just keep the information that these three are a dependent set, but actually keep count of the signs that I have. So this coefficient is positive, this one's negative, negative, and the other three never played in this circuit. So I could encode this dependent set through this vector with the plus, minus, minus, and zeros everywhere else or say for the other circuit that I had noticed, I might have the minus this one plus this one plus this one gives me zero. So I would have 0 for E1, 0 for E2, minus 43, 0 for E4, plus and plus for E5 and 6. And I'm keeping just the signs of these um, linear combinations, these coefficients. What I get when I do this is something called an oriented matrix. Underlying this oriented matrix is just a regular matrix. I just need to ignore the signs and I get a matroid. If I pay attention to the signs, I get an oriented matroid. And it turns out that I can get oriented matroids from graphs. So if I go back to my graph that I got from this matrix, all I have to do is give an orientation to my edges. And what is this plus minus minus telling me? It's telling me that if I go through this edge according to the orientation, I don't know if it's very visible, but if I follow the orientation of this one and go through my circuit, the other two edges, I will find them backwards. I will have to go against the grain, you know, against the rules of traffic. So this one I'm going with the grain against, against, plus, minus, minus. For my other circuit, unless I've made a mistake, I would go minus, plus, plus. And I can check that this, um, these vectors with these signs would consistently encode for on the one hand, what are the coefficients of these linear combinations? And on the other hand, how do I find the edges as I traverse these, um, these circuits? So um, at this point, I hope I have convinced you that these matroids are interesting objects. And uh, when we try to really get at the core of what it means to have linear dependence or linear independence and let's abstract this into a combinatorial setting, which is basically what Whitney has done, I've connected all these different things and, um, and I've discovered this new thing called the matroid. So there are many classes of matroids and I've put this picture that I'm recycling from something else. So I, has, I have a lot of things that I haven't mentioned so far, but this is like, um, like a pose set. No? So graphic matrix, the matrix that I get out of graphs are way at the bottom. They're contained in this class of regular matroids. Regular matroids are matrices that arise out of matrices, but very specific matrices that are totally unimodular. So all their entries are zero plus minus one and their partial determinants are zero plus minus one. So these ones have very nice structure. They're obviously contained in the group of the class of matroids that arise from any real matrix. I can also get uh, matrices over the complex numbers given me matroids. I can get matrices over uh, finite fields and get matroids out of them. And these orientable matroids contain real matroids, contain graphic matroids. And so I'm 
pointing at this class, among other things, to tell you there's life beyond graphs and there's life beyond vector spaces. The, some of these matroids cannot, do not come from a matrix at all. They do not come from a graph at all. Um, and yet they have these properties that we have ex extracted from graphs and vector spaces. So this is a very rich field. And um, this uh, little chart that I had that translated from vector spaces to graphs and back is, is telling me that um, maybe I can take some problem from graph theory and see what, it, what that tells me about vector spaces, or I can get a property from vector spaces and see what it tells me about graphs. And I can do this play. So um, how can we, how can, what can we do now that we have all of this? Can we maybe take some of our problems from graph theory and try to push them into any of these other bigger classes of matroids and see if any of those things make sense or if we gain anything by having done all of this abstraction and generalization. So I want to just mention a couple of problems, some of my favorites. The first one seems like a very simple problem. It's the problem of counting the number of bases. So imagine that I'm working this problem for graphs. What I'm trying to do is to count the number of spanning trees in a connected graph. Well, that's a well-known problem that has an easy solution. Kirchhoff came up with this solution. So it's been around for a while when he was doing electrical networks, he worked out that if you were given a graph, a connected graph, he could come up with a matrix from the graph. It doesn't matter what this matrix is. I have here the details of what it is, but if you don't know enough graph theory to know what the adjacency matrix is or the, or the degree matrix, don't worry. Just think that out of the graph, you get a matrix. And now if you want to know the number of spanning trees from that, in that graph, all you have to do is evaluate one cofactor from this matrix, any one you like, your favorite cofactor. And that cofactor is going to give you the number of trees. Actually, Kirchhoff apparently came up with a different um, formula for trees using eigenvalues. So this is a problem that obviously has been around for a long time and we know a solution and it seems very easy. So what happens if we try to take this well-known problem that we know how to solve and we extend it to other classes of matrices? Well, one of the tricks of mathematics is every time you create or you come up, you construct a new structure, then you want to operate on it. So we define operations and we, these operations give us ways of building new, um, new things out of old ones. So we take two graphs and we add them or, or we take two vector spaces and we intersect them or we take two matrices and we uh, do the sum, the sum of them or whatever and we get new ones. So there's a matroid operation called truncation that what it does is sort of chop the top of my of my vector space or the top of my graph. So it sort of squashes it down a bit. If I started with a graph um, with n vertices and all the bases, the spanning trees are going to have n minus one edges. When I do this truncation, say I, do, I started with a graph with 100 vertices and I, tr I can truncate it. So then now the basis of my new matroid are going to be forests of size, say 80. Now this new matroid, it is still a matroid, but it's no longer, it's no longer a graphic matroid. There isn't a graph associated with it. So I cannot use this theorem. This theorem works for connected graphs, but it does not work for uh, these other things that I obtained when I chopped the top of my matroid. And now this problem, I don't know how to solve. Now this problem is difficult, but this problem is still interesting. It turns out that if I could by some way 
count the number of fours of size k, then I would be able to calculate the old terminal rel reliability of the graph. So this is a model where I have a graph and a, a probability that any given edge might fail. So let's say that with probability P, the, the edge is open and with complementary probability one minus P, the edge is closed. So this, um, model, this problem is an everyday problem again. So I could have a network of computers or a, I don't know, oil pipes or whatever. And with given probability, <clears throat> one of those connections might fail. And I'm interested in keeping my network connected. So I want to know the probability that my network will fail or that it stays connected. So this is an interesting problem. We don't know how to solve it. And in fact, this, no, this problem is known to be number P hard. So for those who know um, complexity theory, that means that this problem is pretty much un intractable with what we know so far. So this is what happens when you take a problem that you actually know how to solve and you push it over to bigger classes of matroids, you easily land on something that you cannot solve. So now what happens if we take a difficult problem and we try to generalize it to other classes of matrix? And this is obvious, uh, almost impossible to avoid thinking about extending coloring anywhere because coloring has been the inspiration of so much graph theory that you have to try, you just have to. So we know what a K coloring is, I'm given K colors, and I want to add, assign them to the vertices in a way that neighboring vertices receive different colors. So how can I extend this problem to matroids? And here I run into problem number one, which is that when I define a matroid out of a graph, I worked with the, with the edges and completely lost sight of the vertices. So how can I color if I don't even have vertices? So here's how you do it. You work with the tension. So this is another way of understanding coloring. Um, I've put, I've given numbers to my colors. So I have one, two, three, and I've taken an orientation of my graph. Any orientation will do. It's just a technical device and I can change the orientation and it will not change anything. It's just, it's just a device. And I will give to my edges a number, which is the result of doing the color on the head minus the color on the tail. So one minus two gives me minus one, two minus one gives me one, two minus three gives me minus one, and so on, no? Three minus one gives me two. So this is what we call attention. And an any interesting proper property is that if I go around the cycle, say this one, and my coloring was proper, then I will go minus one, minus one, plus two, that gives me zero. Now this sum has to be oriented. So that's another reason why I wanted to tell you about oriented matrix. I'm gonna play the same game. So if I'm going forward on this edge, that's one, backward on this one. So I change the sign, plus two, and forward on this one, minus two, this also gives me zero, right? So because if I'm going this way, this edge, I will go backwards. So I multiply this by minus one, I get one. And now when I go around, one plus one minus two gives me zero. So out of any proper coloring, I get a tension. And out of every tension, I get a coloring. And the way I do it is just pick a vertex, give it color one. And now when you move along an edge, one plus one gives me two. When I move along this edge, two minus one gives me one. One minus minus two gives me three. So out of every coloring, I can get a tension. Out of every tension, I can get a coloring. 
And now I'm ready to do coloring on matroids. Obviously, I need my matroids to be orientable so that I can do this orientation business and come up with a notion of coloring and see what happens. So I don't want to show you result, results because it starts getting very technical and it's not the point of this, of this talk. Really what I wanted to do is just tell you about these structures because I'm fascinated by this connection between linear algebra and combinatorics. There's another thing that fascinates me, which is this notion of duality that we have in graph theory for planar graphs and that we have in, in vector spaces with this sort of orthogonal complement notion. And that also works, that, that interplay also works. It's the subject of another, another presentation. Um, but what I will say is that there is this invariant, the TAT polynomial, and I want to mention it because TAT started working with this for graphs when he was trying to work coloring problems. He was trying to work on the four color problem, in fact, but generally in coloring. And he started um, trying to tackle it from a different perspective. And he came up with this invariant that works not only for graphs. So when I do coloring in graphs, I have the chromatic polynomial that counts the number of proper colorings with K colors for any graph. And the chromatic polynomial is just a um, sort of baby, baby version of the TAD polynomial. The TAD polynomial encodes a lot of information. It can be defined for any matroid. And these two problems that I told you are in fact solved if I could really work out this polynomial for any matroid because the number of bases of a matrix is an evaluation of the type polynomial and the number of proper coloring in the graph is an evaluation of the type polynomial. And this type polynomial can be extended to matrix. And it's a different way in which I could define coloring and it has, it has also been studied. So I think I want to stop here and just say, um, this is one of these situations where you can generalize an idea and gain a lot. Now, once you've done that, of course, problems tend to get a little bit harder. And so this picture that I gave you of the different classes of matroids, which I think is all the way up here, um, it's, it's, it's encoding a little bit. So many of the things that we do for graphs, we can do for regular matrix. So if you, if you have something that works on graphs, it often works on regular matrix. But once you go further up, things start to get a little bit difficult. So some of the coloring notions will work for regular. Some of the coloring notions will work for orientable. I've worked on a version of coloring that works for these complex matrices. And um, the interesting thing is that, um, well, everything is interesting, but one interesting thing is this, that these two classes that seem very different have a similar structure. And so the way in which we do orientation to go this way, can be sort of traced towards a complex matrix. And that's kind of funny because the complex numbers are not even ordered. So it's, it's, a, it's a big world. And the whole point was just to encourage you to take a look at these matroids and um, see if maybe the problem that you're working, working on can be generalized and what you can gain by doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Uh, uh, very nice talk. And I have a question. Okay. 
in the problem about the chromatic number, yes, you you define the the function c, but uh -huh. you use any any criteria for the the side who who is the the vertex because to you because didn't have a a a title of the of the vertex. In in this case, only is the uh, is the color. So, if I have a criterion for who's the head and who's the tail, uh huh, yes. Yeah. You decide what is first and what is in the second place. Um. So you just um define an orientation, and then uh -huh. you have to stick with it. Once you've defined it, you're not allowed to change it. Now, what happens if you change the orientation on one of the edges? So that you, this one is pointing this way and you change it and point it that way. Okay. Then now that the, the value here is going to change, you're going to change it by changing its sign. But what happens when you go around the circuit? You go minus one, minus one is minus two. And then you pick this one the wrong way becomes plus two and it's again zero. Oh. So the orientation is just a technical device, but it doesn't change anything. You can change the orientation and um, and doesn't it doesn't mess up your numbers, right? Because when you change the orientation, what you're doing is changing the sign of the element. But once you've changed the orientation, every time you go around a circuit, now you're gonna go the wrong way around this edge and you're gonna to have to change the sign again, see? So um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You could, you could change a bunch of edges and just try it again. Go around the big circle. So now you go minus one, plus one was zero, minus one plus one is zero, Minus one, minus minus one is zero. Yes, there's a very simple argument of why this is happening. And all you have to do is replace this number by this. And then what you see is that each of these numbers uh, around the circuit is being counted twice with different sign. And so it adds up to zero always. Okay, thanks. Um, I can see if uh, any question in the chat. Um, uh, I have a question, Maid. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, on the in the graph uh, of vector spaces and graphs, mm -hmm. uh, the edges are given by uh, linear independence between the between the vectors? Um, I have a, this, so this is a different representation of graphs through mat matrices where you take the, you, you pick a tree. I think okay. this, I think I'm understanding, if I'm understanding correctly, this is your question. You pick a tree and now every time you add another edge, you know that you're making a unique um, circuit. And so when I add this edge, I find which is the unique circuit and I write an element which is linear combination of these two, right? When I add this new one, it makes a new circuit with my basis and that determines who goes here. And if you pay attention to the orientation, that tells you the signs of the, of the elements that you need to add. So it tells you what com what linear combination you need to use. Is that your question? Yes, that was my question. Thank you. Yes. So this is a different way. So normally what we do when we want to get a matrix out of this graph is, you know, you do this matrix with vertex versus vertex and zero one or vertex versus edges and zero one. But there's this other representation where you put a spanning tree and then you use this um, 
unique cycle that you create every time you add a new edge to decide on the elements from this side. Okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> and if you want, to, this is um, in a book by Trumper. I think it has a uh, Trumper. Ah, I suck at writing with a mouse, sorry. Uh, but I can, I can, we can, we can talk later about. Okay, okay. thank you. And we have a, a question on YouTube. Um, is it not possible to define a graph matroid uh, using the vertex set as a ground set and uh, not necessarily for colorings, but in general? Um, I'm thinking. So you can define a matroid any way you want, as long as you have these properties, right? So you could use the vertex set. The thing is, which family you use um, is going to tell you things about the graph. So I know, so well-known matroids arising from graphs, all the ones I know, the bicycle matroid and the, and the regular matroid, um, it has a name. Um, they are all on the edges. So I don't know of any graph matroid defined on the vertices, but in principle, you could do it. The thing is, you want your families of independent sets and bases and circuits to mean something in the graph, to have a nice interpretation there. So um, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know a nice way of defining it. That would be the answer. I don't really know. All the ones I know are defined on the edges. Okay, thank you, Laura. And uh, we okay. have some questions uh, here, uh, one of Vinicio. Yeah. If, um, if the Grady algorithm characterize the matroids is, my question is, is there some algorithm that characterize the oriented matroids? Ah. I don't know. So oriented matroids um, have a life, a topological life. They have a life um, uh, represented by, and this is actually very nice too. Um, where's my matrix? I think it's just here. Yeah. So each of these vectors could represent a point in our a point in our space, or they could represent the normal of a of a hyperplane, right? So when you work with these more geometric things, you get a, a, a sort of representation of what these would do that has a nice interpretation for the sign because then the vector is pointing one way or another and it gives you a half space of this hyperplane, right? According to this hyperplane. So that's, um, that's, that's what you would do with these matrices and you get really nice flat hyperplanes associated with each of these vectors. If you allow your hyperplanes to wobble a bit and not be straight, then you still have an oriented matrix. That's sort of the generalization there. And I don't know if there is an algorithm that characterizes them, because I think most of the attention has gone to that side of things, you know, to, to look at them as these more geometric objects. And I was so tempted to talk about that, but I didn't think I would have time. <laughs> so I, I stopped myself because also it's a lot of information, but yeah, that is, that is also very nice. And the comment in the 2022 International Congress of Mathematicians, one of the talks will be about matroid theory. Oh, nice. Uh, Federico Ardila will talk nice. about the geometry of geometries. Oh, 
and it is precisely our ma ma the matrix theory. Nice. Yeah, he's very, oh, very good mathematicians, but also he gives very nice talks. So, so you should, I don't know, is this online? Or can I, can you put in the chat the information? Maybe I'll try to. I, I found an archive uh, and, it, and I will put in the chat in a few moments. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura. I have a comment about Marla, Mar, Margot Sata. The name is difficult for me. Thank Only you, it was fascinating. Uh, thank you. Uh, Norma Diez, beautiful. It's so interesting. Thank you. Um, do you have any comments or any questions? I have a, a question. Yes. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. Very, very nice uh, talk. I personally, I teach linear algebra. So it is very interesting, this uh, uh, definition of matroides. I heard many times, but I really, I think that I start to understand today with your, <laughs> with your talk. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I have a, a question. Do you know if, if uh, the problem of domination in graph is working too? For matrix? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. You, you mentioned chromatic number, which is very popular, but do uh -huh. you know something about, do you know if domination is? I, I don't working? know. I've, as such, I haven't heard it, but it could be, it could totally be. Remind okay. me a little bit about domination. It's 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 it one of these labeling problems, or am I thinking the wrong thing? Sorry again. So this domination problem mm -hmm. is it one of these problems where you label the edges? And no, 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 no. Okay. no. no. It's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a set of vertices. Mm -hmm. With the property, uh, the property that any other vertice is at yes. less than at less of one of these. <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. Um, I don't know. It sounds like so. From a so if you think about it in terms of sort of linear algebra, mm, I don't know what this. So, I don't know, this is what I'm thinking. If you have this dominating set, this means that any other, any other vertex will mm -hmm. have a neighbor in here, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this thing you have here is what in Metroid is called a co-circuit. Mm -hmm. So it could be, it could be, this could, this could work, but... Honestly, I don't, I don't know. Ah, okay, thank you. I think I'm answering all your questions with I, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worry. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Laura. No more any question on, on YouTube. Um, now I, um, Julian, say about the video call. Yeah, yes, I thank you and thank you, Laura, for your uh, beautiful and interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna um, show the the contributed works for today. So I'll stop so, sharing. Yes, please. Mm So um, today we have two contributed works. One of them is from Magda Detlef on the on differential and Roman domination, number of a graph. And um, the second one is from Teresa Huextra, numero cero forcing de una gráfica, que tan rápido se propaga un chis. So those will be uh, our uh, last contributed works of this first session of CAR 2021. And uh, now Rita is gonna uh, end this uh, conference. So 
Thank you, Rita. All right. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Julian. I don't know if before of this, uh, any person of the organizer committee like to say something before of me? No. Be my guest. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe if you on the camera, we can have a, the last picture of the conference. Um, so, okay, so um, uh, the end of this CAR 2021 is, uh, is very close. Uh, I'd like to say uh, one more time, thanks to the our invited speaker, this talk, Eva uh, Merce, um, and Laura. Uh, we like to say thanks to the other participants with videos and a poster uh, and all the people that follow us in our social network we invite that they start to follow us and uh, in a personal way i like to say thanks to the great uh, team of the rest of the organizer committee so thank you very much uh, magda senior magda junior uh, Hannah, Julian, and Nait. And uh, we have an announcement that we discussed uh, just yesterday. And uh, I think that all of us are very tired uh, to have to uh, code over play, uh, don't have opportunity to think what to do. So uh, I think that we decide that independent of the situation in the world, the next year, CAR 2022 will be online. So um, we uh, are thinking to send the first call in September. And uh, uh, it's almost sure that the CAR will be in November. So uh, we will send you all of this uh, information. I think that this is a very, very nice way to uh, have conference. Uh, we have opportunity that invite many, many of our friends and colleagues that live in any point of the world. So uh, we, we, we take uh, this, uh, this uh, online uh, conference for the, next, uh, for the next year. So after this, I only like to say thank you very much. Happy Christmas and New Year for everybody. And See you in CAR 2022. Thank you. Um, I want to say something. Thanks everyone watching on, on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe since next year is going to be uh, online. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and to follow us on Facebook. And I would really like to say uh, thanks to my friend uh, Kiwi who made us uh, posters, the banners and the miniatures of the YouTube channel. And thanks everyone for uh, coming and watching all of this conference. All of, of the contributed works were really good. The invited speakers, everything was really nice. And refreshing. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Somebody like to say something Thank more? you all for organizing. It was just <laughs> thank you. And for the nice invitation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 bye.